I'd like to tell you a little bit about myself. I am an evangelical Christian, and by that I mean I view the Bible as God's revelation and Jesus as my Savior. And I'm a biologist that embraces evolution, that all life on Earth shares a common ancestor, including humans. Now, I note upon saying this that some of you are experiencing a fight or flight response because you just realized I'm going to be talking about the E word, evolution. Or maybe you're not religious and you realize I'm going to be talking about the intersection of science and faith. In either case, this is not a very comfortable topic for very many people. And for a long time now, there's been this cultural paradigm that evolution and faith are not compatible. And I want to challenge that. Because my journey reconciling evolution my faith was a really long and lonely one. I grew up in the Catholic tradition. I went to Catholic elementary and junior high. And in public high school, I was a member of Young Life, which is a Christian youth organization. And I don't really remember thinking about evolution much during that time. And I entered college, I was a biology major, and in one of my first biology courses, I remember my professor telling us, you can't believe in God and accept evolution. I thought that was very puzzling. So I went and talked to my pastor about it. And the pastor agreed with the biologist and told me the same thing, you have to choose, God or evolution. And during my four years as a biology major, the evidence for evolution continued to mount. It was very convincing. And since I was told I had to choose, I made the conscious decision to give up God, and I became an atheist. So fast forward to a year after graduation. It's 1989, and I'm in a bad relationship. I have a boring lab job, and I need an incredible life adventure. So I apply for a job, and I move to Japan. And before I left, I mailed myself two large boxes of books, because remember, this is before the internet, so I needed something to do. And I was very lonely while I was in Japan, actually. And I read through those two boxes of books really quickly. And at the bottom of the second box was a Bible. Now, I'm an atheist, so I don't own a Bible. So I don't know how that Bible got in there. I suspect my sister slipped it in. But in either case, I had nothing else to do. So I start reading this Bible. And if you've ever tried to read the Bible, you just start on page one and you work your way through it. It can be kind of complicated. And I had a lot of questions about this God of the Old Testament that I was reading about. So I decided to write some letters to my sister. She had always maintained her Christian faith, and she was very knowledgeable. This is before email. So I handwrite letters of questions to her. I snail mail them back to the States. She patiently responds to my letters. She snail mails them back to me. It took a few months, or a few more than that, but after a while, I decided to dedicate my life to becoming a Christ follower. And then shortly thereafter, it was actually time for me to come back to the States. So now it's 1990. I'm back in the States. And I'm hiding my love of all things biology from my church friends. And I'm hiding my Christian faith from my science colleagues. All because of this narrative that they're not compatible. And my biggest challenge during the 90s was figuring out how to follow the biblical command to love the Lord with my mind. I could love the Lord with my heart and my soul and my strength, but I had to find a way to reconcile the Bible, my faith, and evolution. And it was very difficult. I came to realize that there are many books of the Bible that are not meant to be interpreted literally. For example, Genesis is not written as a scientific text. And in fact, Genesis 1 and 2 actually tell two different stories of the order of creation. And I also learned that different books of the Bible were written to different people and at different times. And when viewed within their context, the messages of those books were so much more beautiful and profound than without that perspective. So I learned during that time that I needed to take the Bible on its own terms and not requiring it to answer questions or provide information it wasn't intended to. 
And that allowed me to take science on its own terms. So fast forward to now. Where am I? I am at a beautiful university perched at the edge of a cliff overlooking the ocean, and I'm a professor of biology. And my, most of my students self-identify as Christians. And based on surveys I've taken for the last several years in the first week of my evolution course, over 90% of my students reject evolution as the explanation for how humans came to be on this earth. In fact, many of my students tell me the same thing that I heard in the 80s, that they heard that you have to choose God or evolution. I want to change that paradigm. We need to provide opportunities to think differently about this. I've identified three misunderstandings. I'm going to call them myths that people seem to need to overcome if they're going to embrace or be open-minded about evolution. Now, these aren't, this isn't the misinformation that we're going to hear from anti-evolution organizations because there are a lot of resources out there that address those, like Biologos. Rather, these are misunderstandings that the typical Christian has, like the person that sits next to me in church or the student that enters my class on the first day. And the first of those myths is that all Christians think the same way I do about evolution. In psychology, they call this the false consensus bias, that everybody in my in-group has the same opinion about concerns and issues. And I found that many people are actually surprised to find that there actually exists a full spectrum of positions that one can hold when you think about evolution and faith. So at the top here above the dotted line, I have a young earth creationist position. They reject an old earth and they reject evolution. In this position, they believe that the organisms and the diversity of life on earth emerged sometime in the last six to 10,000 years in its current form, more or less. Below the dotted line, are all the positions that accept an old earth, but they have different perspectives about evolution. So while the media reports on polls that lead us to believe that Americans are deeply divided over this issue with believers against non-believers, this two-sided debate, the reality is it's actually much more complex than that. <clears throat> I find that many of my students when they learn these different positions, they realize maybe it's okay to think about evolution, be a little more open-minded. And sociologist Jonathan Hill, he conducted a study on this topic. He surveyed 2,900 Americans, a majority of which identified as Christians, and he found out that less than 10% were certain or absolutely certain about a young earth creationist position. And less than 4% were certain about their atheist position. So it's not so black and white. And it's not clear, it's the same, similar. It's not clear cut for pastors either. In 2012, the Barna Group conducted a study of 743 Protestant pastors. And they found that only 19% were certain about a young earth creationist position. So the take home message here is that. Americans' beliefs about this topic are much more complex and nuanced than our in-group or the media leads us to believe. Second myth. Evolution means without a creator. As if without a creator is in the definition of evolution. It's not. In its simplest form, evolution is an explanation for the incredible biological diversity that we see on Earth. A 20th century leading evolutionary biologist talked about it this way. He said, evolution is change in the adaptation and in the diversity of populations of organisms. So how does this change come about? Well, two of the things we often hear about are genetic drift and natural selection. And I'm warning you now, I'm going to move into science a little bit. You might remember learning about natural selection in high school or college. But the basic gist is... <clears throat> In every population, there's variation. So what you have here is three distinct populations. And if I look at just this population, all the individuals vary in both their internal and external traits. And if a new individual is born into that population and that individual has a genetic modification that allows it to survive and reproduce more offspring, 
then that trait has the potential to increase in frequency over the next several generations. And it's this shift in the frequency of traits over long periods of time that's also referred to as evolution. Now, any one individual doesn't change during its lifetime. And we don't see these large leaps or jumps. We don't go from a fish to a frog in two generations. It's a really long, slow, gradual process. And it occurs at the level of populations. And I like the way geneticist Dr. Dennis Venema provides an analogy from the English language to help us understand that this change is occurring slowly and gradually. He provides a verse from the 10th century, John 1.29. We can't make much sense of this verse. And then we look at it in the 14th century, a word or two, 16th century, 17th century, and today. And he also provides examples of the minor or small word transitions over time of each word. Little, gradual, small changes. But when we compare the 10th century verse to the 21st century verse, it looks like a dramatic shift. So i got to connect this to biology, right? This is English language. What does this have to do with evolution? Well, species emerge very gradually over time. And if I take a population, like this one here, and I split it into two separate populations, these two populations over long periods of time will accumulate genetic modifications, genetic differences. Different ones in this population than this population. And if I give it enough time, when I put those two populations back together, they may have diverged into different species. But this doesn't happen in 1,000 or 10,000 years we get the incredible biological diversity that we see on Earth in the last three billion years. So what does this have to do with without a creator? I started with myth number two, evolution means without a creator. Well, I hope that you realize from some of the definitions I've given you that none of it talks about a creator at all. So this idea <clears throat> comes from a small, very vocal group of atheists. And they've put forth this idea that if you accept evolution, you have to adopt a particular worldview. The argument is that evolution is this grand theory that can explain everything about humans, including human behavior. But what you need to know is they have overstepped the boundaries of science and they've shifted into philosophy. So accepting biological evolution to explain the incredible diversity of life on Earth does not require you to adopt a particular worldview. Philosophical naturalism is this worldview that nothing exists except the natural world. You can accept evolution and reject that worldview. So I found out that once people begin to disentangle the philosophical worldview from what the science is trying to explain, they actually get curious about evolution. And sometimes they even start asking questions. And then I, of course, bring up human evolution. And while there's a preponderance of evidence and data to support the fact that humans evolved in the same processes that all the other organisms on Earth did, people tell me they reject human evolution because of myth number three. If humans evolve from a common ancestor with other organisms, then this makes us less special. Well, I would say that this concern is definitely one for theologians and philosophers, and not very much a comfort zone for a biologist. But I do actually take the time to dialogue and listen to people that share this concern with me, because it does help them think a little bit more about human evolution. And the idea is, people seem to say, I'm not as special because of how I'm created. I would say you're special because you're loved by God. And you're special because you are the only organisms that can respond in relationship to God. And we're also special because we believe Jesus died on the cross for us. And these are the things that make us special, not how we are created. 
So just because science can give us an explanation for events, some causal reasoning for events, that doesn't mean there's less room for God. So we can talk about it this way. Science can provide a mechanism for things that occur. But religion provides us the agency behind that mechanism. When we say God created, we're not talking about the process. We're talking about the agency behind that process. And for me, and for other Christians that accept evolution, the more we learn from the fossil evidence and from the genetic data, the more reasons we have to worship God, not less. So when we view evolution through our eyes of faith, we can marvel and be awestruck at God's incredible, complex, and majestic process of creation. It's exciting. I challenge you to go there. This E word, evolution. This can be a very difficult and oftentimes emotional topic for many for reasons that have nothing to do with the science. But there's another E word, evangelical. And this often elicits a physical response from many. A lot of people equate evangelical with anti-intellectual or rejecting mainstream science. And, and in our current political situation, there's a whole group of people that apparently all vote the same way, the evangelical vote. We need to stop using these words incorrectly. We need to challenge this paradigm and question our assumptions, our philosophical, our theological, our scientific assumptions about this topic of evolution and faith. Because it's a heavy burden that we place on our youth when we tell them they have to choose between good science and their authentic faith. And it's wrong to force them to make that choice. I want to change the cultural myth that evolution and faith are not compatible because they are compatible. Thank you.